Hey everybody, Gary here with Guitar Tricks, and in this video I want to take you behind the scenes and show you how I make these videos for the Guitar Tricks YouTube channel and share a little bit of my own personal background as a musician, an educator, and a video maker. So let's start with the present moment, how I'm making this video, how I make these videos, and then we'll work our way backwards. So let me bring you into my studio. So I'm in Austin, Texas, and this is a little studio space that I share with a bunch of other musicians, a bunch of other bands. I have band rehearsal in this room, but I also use it during the day and the morning hours to film video because musicians, they're late to bed, late to rise. So a lot of the action here is after hours, after work hours, into the night, but in the morning, it's like a ghost town. So even though there's like 12 rooms just like this in this facility, there is nothing going on. Sometimes around noon, people start to pile in, so I try to get here around eight or 9 a.m and get the videos done while it's really quiet. So the reason why I shoot here instead of at home is because of just how quiet it is. You can't hear the heat, you can't hear the air condition, and when there's no one around, it's super quiet. You can't hear traffic. So I don't have those things going on at home. Just having windows, you know, you hear a lot of that outside noise, but this is just kind of a closed box and there's no other noise, so I like to be in here. So as you can see, it's a tiny room, I set up my cameras, I set up my lights, got the backdrop to stick with the Guitar Tricks black background. Now some of you might be wondering why I never use these amps behind me. It's because they're not mine. One of the other guys that also rents out the room, those are his amps and we have a strict don't play other people's amps without permission policy. And when I record, I use my own amps. If you wanna see the two amps that I use, check out the video Tube for Solid State. I use a Fender 30 as my main tube amp, and I use a Rolling Cube 30 as my main solid state amp. And sometimes I go right into my interface. So here's the gear I'm using. I use a Favitech Studio Pro kit that I got on Amazon, I think for about 180 bucks. It's three lights. I only use two out of the three. One of them goes overhead. And then I also use a little light behind me. This guy right here. And so one light is like full blast, the other's a little calmer, and that just kind of creates a more three-dimensional thing where it's not flattened out. So, you know, there's more light on this side of me than there is on this side of me. Sometimes I don't like when it's too dramatic. It's It looks weird. So, you know, I've got both lights at me. One has all five lights on, the other only has one light on. So that's how I do that. As far as my audio, I've got right overhead and out of sight is, I'll just drop it down for a second so you could see. There it is, peeking out. So I've got this, uh, it's a Rode NT1 or NT2. It's a uh, condenser microphone on a shock mount. And I use that for everything. And that just goes right overhead. So I'm still kind of speaking right into it. But sometimes if you see me look down, you know, the audio won't be, uh, the audio will get lower for a second. And then from this mic, we go into a Focusrite two channel Scarlet 2i2 interface that goes into my MacBook Pro into Logic. And that's how I capture the audio. As far as my cameras, I've got a Panasonic Lumix GH3 1080p camera. That one takes really good, more cinematic uh, wide angle shot so that's what I use for my wide angle for this video I'm only using the wide angle and then I use a 4k uh, G7 Panasonic Lumix which is my close-up camera and what's great about the 4k is if you shoot in 4k you can uh, zoom into the video up to like you know 160 200 percent and it still is very clear so shooting in 4K allows you to kind of zoom in in post-production and still have the clarity of the video. Whereas with the 1080, sometimes I'll go 105%, 110% of the original size, but anything more than that, it really starts to get blurry. So I like having that 4K camera to do the close-up stuff. And then I just put a couple memory cards in there. I use 64 gigabyte memory cards. Uh, I try to be as chintzy with my footage as possible. When I first started out, I would let the camera roll all day long and then I'd have these filled up cards, 
filled up hard drives, filled up computer. So now I try to make sure I'm prepared for the video before I press record instead of doing a million dress rehearsals. So it helps have an outline and know exactly what you're going for before you start. So then after the video's shot, what I do is in Final Cut Pro, I create a library. This one I'll title it GT Teacher Spotlight Gary Heimbauer or something like that. Then I create a project file and I make sure that I create that project in an external hard drive because these projects, they take up so much space, I would never be able to host them on my computer. So I always have an external hard drive. And then once a video is published, I'll delete that library just so I could keep using the same hard drive. It could get expensive. If I didn't delete libraries, I'd have 100 hard drives. So I have to you know, know when it's time to let something go. So then I drag all the files and the sound into that library and then I match the audio from the camera with the audio from the logic file. So the sound waves are usually identical, just one sounds a lot better than the other. And then from there, I add graphics, I chop things up. You know, usually I shoot on average between 45 minutes and an hour per video that ends up anywhere between six minutes to 20 minutes, right? So a lot of it gets cut and thrown out. So a little bit about how I got to this moment. So as far as music goes, I've always been obsessed with music. Ever since I was four or five years old, I got really into Elvis Presley as a kid. I don't know, I saw him on TV somewhere, singing Heartbreak Hotel or whatever, and just seeing you know, him play that guitar and sing and move, I wanted to be like Elvis. So I remember I had a little poster of him as a little kid behind my bed, and I told my mom, I wanna play guitar. So she got me a guitar, got me guitar lessons. Uh, the first lessons actually made me hate guitar because the person was trying to teach me how to play classical music and read and it was just had nothing to do with Elvis. So then I put the guitar down, didn't get back into it until, I don't know, maybe fifth or sixth grade. Then I started learning more by myself and with one of my sister's friends learning like Nirvana and Green Day and Offspring and kind of that grunge stuff. I grew up in the grunge era. And then in high school, I started a band, which I didn't play guitar, I just sang in the band. And then when I got into college, 18, 19, I got really into jazz and blues and improv. So I was originally a journalism major, travel journalism, switched from travel journalism to study jazz and music. I lived in New York, so I went to City College in New York, studied with a jazz teacher, got my music ed degree, uh, played in bands throughout my 20s. Then I became a public school music teacher in Queens, New York uh, when I was about 30. I'm 36 now. So did that for three years. That was amazing. One of the most amazing three years of my life. So the challenge of teaching 600 children a week from pre-K through fifth grade while having the goal of making them all excited to be in my class, excited to learn music, helped me develop an approach to teaching that's very clear, very patient, very fun, not putting too much pressure, making sure the student is engaged. Uh, so that was really a formative experience for me as a teacher. Uh, and then while I was doing that, I was getting my master's at Teachers College, Columbia University. That was also a really formative experience because a lot of the teachers that I was classmates with and the staff uh, just had so many great progressive ideas about music education. And as a music teacher, I did modern bands. So I taught guitar, keyboard, songwriting, bass, drum set, electronics, all that stuff. And one of the ways that I would teach my kids is by creating videos. So I would say, go home, watch this video, and I created a school YouTube channel. So that's when I first started making instructional videos on YouTube, it was for my students. But then I realized people all over the world were watching these videos, even though I made them for my, you know, 600 students in my school, there was, 10,000 views on how to you know play a song or whatever. Um, and that was all in iMovie where you could just put one little graphic. So then naturally after I learned everything about iMovie, I moved on to Final Cut Pro, which is like iMovie on steroids. It's the same as GarageBand versus Logic Pro. So that was amazing. And then being I made so many videos, had this school YouTube channel, it kind of created a buzz. And then there's an organization called Little Kids Rock that hired me to be their national training manager where I trained other music teachers on how to do modern band programs in public schools. So I worked with them, I traveled all over the world, taught teachers 
in different cities in the United States, in Haiti, in Australia, how to do all these different popular music genres in the classroom while still meeting their standards that they're held to in the public school system. Then after being the national training manager and doing all those trainings, they saw I had a knack for the videos and the PowerPoints and the presentations. So then from there, I became the director of curriculum, created a few chapters in their curriculum, online courses for their website and presentation materials for the teacher trainings. So all of that also helped me expand my skills as far as creating visual resources that now I like to bring into my videos to help people learn, not just by listening, not just by watching me, but seeing you know visual resources that are going to help them. So I did that for two years, and then I decided to take all these skills and start my own business called Pow Music. And as Pow Music, I contract, and then I have my own channel and school called Pow Music. So the big difference between what I was doing then and now is just interaction. So on one sense, I'm reaching more people now through these videos, through other videos uh, all over the world, which is exciting. It's easy to lose track of that because you see, you know, okay, 20,000 views, 40,000 views, and it's just a number. It's not a face, it's not a person. But if you do sit and think about it, it is really a privilege and it makes me feel great when I realize, wow, all those people are learning something because of what I created. Uh, however, I do really miss being with students, being with kids, being with teachers and doing all that. So that's why I make sure I still do teacher training. So I trained some teachers in the DeSoto School District outside Dallas uh, last year on doing Modern Band in the program. And then actually in a, two weeks from now, I'll be training some Dallas teachers for Little Kids Rock on how to do Modern Band in the classroom. And I also present at their annual Modern Band Summit on some of the POW music resources that I've created. And all of that stuff is great for me because doing the solo online curriculum video thing, uh, it could get pretty lonely. Whereas, you know, in the past I had classrooms of people to teach. So, you know, if I could do that once in a while and just make sure I'm interacting with people, it's good for my mental health. And, uh, and it makes me feel good, so. <laughs> so that's where I'm at now. I live in Austin, Texas. I play in a cover band called Velvet Jukebox, and then also a funk dance project that doesn't have a name yet because we're just getting it off the ground. We rehearse in this very room. And then I also just play around town solo acoustic stuff. So that's kind of the deal on how the teaching, the playing, and the video stuff uh, has all come together to make YouTube kind of the perfect place to bring my skills together. So the way that I met Guitar Tricks was they were looking for instructors to do uh, small group webinar lessons a few times a week for uh, some of their premium members that wanted extra help. They could join in at the same time every week and it was a small group thing and they could come in on video and just kind of interact in this small group video environment. So then once I started doing those webinars for Guitar Tricks, I had the all access pass. I saw their resources. I would help students kind of with extra help as they followed the Guitar Tricks resources. And I totally believe in the Guitar Tricks website. It's a great system. There's so many songs and the song lessons are really in depth. So you'll have like five videos per song with downloadable tab jam tracks, and then they also have a core learning system. So it's a really great program. So I did that for a year or so. And then they asked us to make a like uh, teacher bio, a mini bio video. And they saw through the video, oh, he does video production. This is like a really good video. And that's when they asked me if I was interested in doing uh, YouTube videos as well for them. And not only did I believe in their resources and the website, they're also great people that are very easy to work with. All right, everybody, if you have any questions that I didn't answer or you wanna know more about how I make these videos, feel free to leave a comment. Happy playing, and I'll see you guys in the next lesson. Take care. <laughs>